right, now that you have turned to the book of Nahum, let us pray as we open up the Word of God. Well, Jesus, we, uh, we thank you that you uh, are over all and you're through all, um, both the good moments and the hard moments. Uh, we thank you that um, you never ha- needed a plan B, that nothing was ever out of your uh, foresight, nothing was ever out of your control, uh, nothing was ever out of reach. Um, and when our life was out of control, uh, when help was out of reach, you reached in. And so, God, today as we open up um, the book of Nahum, uh, would we find comfort? Would we find peace? Uh, would we maybe not find all the answers that we've been asking questions to? But would we find the answer that we need that can give rest to our souls? And if you would, take a moment and pray for yourself and ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. And if you'd be so kind, uh, pray for me that I would speak clearly and be helpful to you. Oh, Father, we love you. We trust you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since we're not in third grade, uh, the second law of thermodynamics states that as one goes forward in time, the net entropy of any isolated or closed system will always increase. As one goes forward in time, as you live your life, the, the, the sum of entropy or chaos of any isolated or closed system will always increase. So entropy is the measure of disorder in a system. It explains why life always tends to get more and not less complicated as time goes on. And according to the second law of thermo, as time progresses, left alone, disorder and chaos will increase, uh, which is why left to their own devices, every middle school boy's room is just a tornado of everywhere. Uh, And I definitely just saw a mom look at her son. That's fantastic. Left alone, middle school boys' rooms turn to utter chaos. I don't know about middle school girls. I'll find out in about 10 years. Uh, But I'm betting it's probably the same, just not nearly to the same degree. Which is why left to their own devices, the kitchen sink doesn't get less full. Uh, The laundry doesn't get less mountainous. The stains don't get more and more out. Uh, Left to their own devices, the world just kind of tends to devolve towards chaos. Uh, And we spend so much of our time and so much of energy just trying to wrangle in and control the chaos. And then we get tired and it just spills over a little bit. And then the sink is looking like the laundry pile. That life tends towards chaos, not towards order. That life tends towards crazy, not towards peaceful. But what do you do when life gets chaotic? Because it's going to get there, and it might be there right now. What do you do? How do you cope with the chaos? How do you find comfort? Where do you try and find comfort when life begins to get out of control? Uh, When life gets out of control for me, I go to two things. I go to uh, control, and I go to chocolate. I go to chocolate um, because I know it's going to give me the endorphin hit that I want because I just want to feel better in the moment, and so I know that that's going to work. Uh, I know there is a whole box of full-size candy bars that her mother and sister gave us that's just bad for me. Like, it's a bad idea that I know that's in the pantry. And then there's a whole jar of chocolate chips that sits in the, in the, in the upper right corner. I know exactly where they are. I know where they are in my sleep. And when life gets crazy, I run a chocolate because it's going to make me feel good. So I hit the chocolate first, and then I just turn to control. Okay, what can I do to manage the chaos? Okay, let's do a little bit here financially. Let's do a little bit here with our schedules. Let's do this thing. Like, let me just gain some control over the system, over what I control. Even though in the back of my head, I know that, like, what's actually making life chaotic, I can't even begin to touch right now. But let me just hunker down with my endorphin hit from my chocolate, and let me control what I can control, and maybe begin to feel stable and okay. And it still doesn't work. It doesn't stop the chaos. It brings like momentary relief. It does. I I know how hormones work. I eat the chocolate. I feel good. I make some control. I feel a little bit better, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. It's only momentary relief. So what, what do you do when life gets chaotic? Where do you run to? 
Uh, what do you, you run into to try to find some peace in the midst of crazy? Because we all have it. We all run somewhere. Now, why do I ask you that question? Uh, for this reason, in Nahum chapter 1, uh, it opens up and it tells us how to find comfort in the chaos. Uh, God opens the book of Nahum and tells us as his people how to find comfort in chaos. See, Nahum is part two of the book of Jonah, uh, which we finished up last week. And in Jonah, uh, for those of you that, that may not have been here, Jonah sent his prophet to this people called Nineveh, which was the capital, it was the DC of the kingdom of Assyria. And they were objectively, morally evil and awful people. And God sent Jonah to pre preach a message of repentance to the Ninevites. And what we see happen is, is they do. Like they, they hear the message of God, however badly it was preached, and they turn as like an entire city from their sin to God. And God relents of the disaster that he was going to bring as just payment for their sin. And Jonah was written to Nineveh around 760 B.C., uh, and the Assyrians end up conquering the nation of Israel 40 years later in 720. 722 BC. So 760 is Jonah, 722, uh, Assyria and Nineveh conquer Israel. And then Nahum's written around 660 BC. So 100 years after Jonah. So we've, we've gone through Jonah, a whole century has passed, and now we have reached Nahum. And the Nineveh that Jonah found, the Nineveh that we saw, uh, is a very different place. Uh, that people that was broken and repentant have now turned from God and turned back to their sin, and the generations have changed, and they look just like they did before Jonah showed up. And now in Nahum, God's not calling for their repentance. He's calling for their judgment. Because God's people have been occupied, they have been dispersed, they've been enslaved, they've been tortured, and they've been asking what Psalm 13 asks for who knows how long, how long, O oh Lord. And I think we feel that when life gets crazy and life gets chaotic. Like there's this question that just begins to rise in our soul. Like, how long is this going to go on? Their life is dark when we open the book of Nahum. That God's people's life is dim and there's not a lot of hope left in them. But God wants to comfort Israel in the midst of their chaos. Because God wants to comfort us in our own. How? By knowing uh, who God is and what God does. Like that's where he starts. Let me remind you of who I am and what I do. So here's the point for today, because this one took me like a lot of juggling to like get easy. And so I just want to give you the end and then tell you how we're going to get there. So the point for today is this, that we can find comfort in chaos. I'm sure you picked up on that one already. But Why? And the answer Nahum gives us is because God is good. And that's the point. We can find comfort in chaos because God is good. And the path for us to get there is, is a few questions. How? So what? And now what? How is God good? So, so what does that mean? And now what does that mean for us? How is God good? So what does that mean? And now what does that mean for us? So first, how is God good? Uh, Nahum begins the search for comfort in chaos by talking about God's character. And he tells us three things. First, uh, Nahum tells us that God is good. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, he literally just says, Yahweh is good. And then he tells us that the Lord is just and the Lord is loving. Uh, verse 2 says, Yahweh is a jealous and avenging God. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger, great in power, and Yahweh will, and Yahweh will by no means clear the guilty. So first, Nahum, pretty easy and straightforward, tells us that God is good. But right before that, he kind of lists off these six other things that God is, and they fall into two categories, that God is just and that God is loving. Nahum draws attention to the fact that God is just. That's why he can say that God is an avenging God, that he's a wrathful God, that he takes vengeance and he doesn't clear the guilty. Uh, according to the dictionary, to be just is acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good. For God to be just means that God uh, both 
is and his character and in his actions uh, meets and lives up to and upholds this objective moral standard of goodness and that he is good. Like sometimes like the lens that we have on in life looks like he might not be, but that doesn't mean that we're seeing correctly. Like we can see things wrongly and God can still be good. And so God is just. He is always going to live up to and act out of an objective measure of goodness, that he is going to be just, that he is going to right wrongs, that he is going to pay back evil, and everything that comes out of his hand will be just and good. God is just. Second, Nahum draws our attention to the fact that God is loving. Nahum says that God is jealous, and later he says that God is slow to anger. Uh, Both of those are direct quotes out of the book of Exodus and Um, One comes from Exodus 20, and one comes from Exodus 34. In Exodus 20, we read, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Exodus 34. And Exodus 34 is like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Like, it just pops up everywhere. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. I don't know if you've ever been around a group of uh, 20-year-old-ish college guys, but they have this really strange ability to communicate in movie and TV quotes, like exclusively. It's pretty impressive. Uh, My brother and I lived together in college for a year, And our TV show of choice was The Office. Uh, It's been discontinued. It it couldn't air anymore. Um, But it's very sad. But uh, that was our show. And that is like almost exclusively how we would communicate is we would just communicate in quotes from uh, the TV show The Office. And oftentimes we didn't even have to like finish the line. Like one of us would just say the beginning of the line and the other one would either go, (laughs) yeah, I know I know how your day was now. Uh, Or they would then finish the line and we would go back and forth to see how long we could go. Uh, It's a weird phenomenon in the 20-year-old male brain, but we do it. We just begin to communicate in full or partial movie quotes, and our friend group totally understands the conversation. But if you walked into that, you'd be like, okay, these guys are crazy. Not only do they still, like, kind of smell bad, but, like, what? I I thought they were supposed to be in college and learning things, and all they're doing is quoting movies. Like, do they even go to class? No. That's how the Hebrew Bible works. Um, The Hebrew Bible and the authors of the Hebrew Bible expect that we pick up on the movie quotes that they're dropping. And so when Nahum says that uh, God is a jealous God, uh, he's expecting like a 20-year-old college sophomore, we can go, oh yes, God is a jealous God. That's why we shouldn't bow down to idols and uh, he rescued us out of Egypt and slavery. Like he expects that we're going, oh yeah, Exodus 20. Of, Of course, I've seen that one 13 times last week. And then when he says that God is slow to anger, he's expecting that we are going, oh, yeah, Exodus 34 is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Yeah, 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 I got you. I read that one twice this morning. That there's this understanding of how they communicated that's kind of like 20-year-old college guys. They can just drop these quotes and everyone follows along. They also had the thing memorized, which which helps. Uh, I, I don't. And if you do, that's pretty incredible. But Nahum, when he's writing this, is expecting that when he says God is jealous, that our minds go, oh yeah, Exodus 20. God's jealous because he loves Israel, because he rescued them and said, I'm going to set my love on you and you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. That he's not jealous out of some sense of anger or self, uh, self-deficiency, that he's jealous because he loves them and he rescued them. And when he just drops this, oh, and he's slow to anger, it's like, oh yeah, he is slow to anger because he's gracious and he's merciful And he's abounding in faithful love. Like that was what was meant to be triggered in our minds when we we heard those things. Is we were meant to reflect on the fact that he's jealous because he's loving. And he's slow to anger because he's abounding in faithful, faithful love. And so Nahum starts off by telling us that God is just and God's loving. That's what God is like. And he is just and he is loving ultimately because he's good. Because God is good, he has to be just. And because God is good, God is loving. Both his love and his goodness flow out. Both his love and his justice flow out of his goodness. That's who he is. Now, what is he like? So the how is God good by being just and being 
loving. So what does that mean? Because God is just and loving, God acts in justice and in love. Who he is becomes what he does. His identity determines his activity. Because God is love, God loves. And because God is just, God does justice. He doesn't come out right and say it uh, because it's poetry, right? Like this whole book is just a, a prophetic poem. And poems make their point off of pictures. They make their point off of feelings. They kind of make their way around it. And as you read the whole thing, it begins to just unfold and make more and more sense. Poetry builds meaning upon pictures and emotions. In verse 3, Nahum says, God's way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. In verse 7, it says, Yahweh's good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, He will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Nahum says that God is a stronghold for some, and he's an overflowing flood for others. That God is a storm for some people, and he's the shelter from the storm for others. Why? Because God's just, and he's loving, because he's good. Therefore, God does justice and does love. He brings a storm over some people in justice. And he shelters some people from the storm in love. That sounds a lot like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. That there's the storm that's going to come and beat against the house. It's actually going to beat against both houses, but only one of them is going to stand. It sounds a lot like the Exodus when both the Israelites and the Egyptians walked through the Red Sea. But one of them walked through dry and then on dry ground. And one of them walked through and got crushed by the ocean. God is simultaneously the storm and the shelter from the storm, because God is simultaneously both just and loving, because he does simultaneously both do justice and do love. How does God act in love and in justice at the same time, Justin? Don't those like completely opposed realities? Well, on Wednesday, August 28th of 2023, Hurricane Idalia uh, made landfall at Florida's Big Bend. Uh, it was a Category 3 hurricane, with winds uh, gusting at 125 miles per hour, which were the strongest winds and the strongest storm uh, that uh, hurricane that the uh, Florida Big Bend coast had seen since the 1800s. In 200 years, this was the strongest storm that they had seen. And classes at Florida State University, they were canceled for the week because, you know, there was this like hurricane moving in and they had to get the kids out. And the state began to brace itself for the storm that would uh, inevitably come and while people, you know, bunkered down and some people led, there was a contingency of Florida State University students who stuck around and partied all week long in this thing called a hurricane party. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're, they're idiotic to say the least. But what's a hurricane party? I'm really glad you asked. Simply, it's a party thrown as you wait for the hurricane to come in, and then you continue to throw it as the hurricane comes and beats, and then if you survive the hurricane, you continue in the debauchery and the foolishness after the hurricane leaves, despite whatever water or power you might not have. Yay, hurricane. That's a hurricane party. It sounds like a terrible, terrible idea to me, but in an interview, uh, one college student from SFU said, uh, yeah, we're not worried. Um, We're from Florida. Uh, We know what to expect. Like, we've been through some hurricanes before, so we're just going to have a good time before it shows up, and then, you know, with whatever happens in the aftermath, we'll just, it'll be fine. Despite being told by the national and state authorities to, to, to either hunker down or leave, this guy's standing on the street outside at a bar interviewing uh, with the local news saying, yeah, I'm from Florida. I know how to handle storms. I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to have a good time. Now, why would you go to a party at a bar when a hurricane is literally on the way and it's already raining? Like, what is wrong with you? Like, what kind of person decides to throw a party in the face of a hurricane? Those things kill people. Because some people do two things. They overestimate themselves and they underestimate the storm. They overestimate themselves. Oh, yeah, I'm from Florida. I know how to do this. And they underestimate the storm. And in flows the storm of two centuries. Some people get caught in the storm. 
and some people find cover from the storm. Because some people overestimate themselves and they underestimate the storm. And some people rightly estimate themselves and rightly estimate the storm. And they realize they don't have what it takes to, to face this thing. So they got to find shelter somewhere or they're going to get caught up in it. And according to Nahum, God is bringing a storm. And you will either find yourself caught in the storm or covered over from the storm. You will either find yourself caught in the justice of God or covered over in the love of God. And that's what appears to be the tension of the opening of Nahum 1. That somehow there's this, this justice over here and there's this love over here. And how do they work together? If one's bringing a storm and one's cover from the storm, how does this work together? Because see, there appears to be tension in the text from line 1. Nahum opens and says, An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Um, in Hebrew, uh, Nahum just means comfort. And in Hebrew, the word for oracle means burden. So literally, the first words of the book of Nahum are the burden concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of comfort. Burden, comfort, justice, love, storm, a shelter. There appears to be tension in the text. But I would argue it's not tension. It's two concepts working in tandem. Because see, tension implies two forces working against one another. Uh, it's the idea of a rope being pulled taut, or when you lift heavy things, you've, you're on the bench and the weight's coming down and gravity's pushing against you and you have to push it away. That's tension. It's the idea of two, a system working with two opposing forces, someone pulling left, someone pulling right, but it's something in tandem is two things working together, like two horses harnessed to a cart pulling it, like two grown men on a tandem bike trying to win an amazing race event on Mackinac Island, totally hypothetical. It was for a wedding. But on a tandem bike, when you're two grown men, you, 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 know, you have your two seats, you have your two handlebars, you have your two pedals, and uh, two grown men on a tandem bike takes some force to move, especially when they send you up the hills of Mackinac Island that are not flat at all, and now you have two grown men on a nicely blue dainty tandem bike going up a hill. You have to work together. If one of you stops pedaling, you stop moving. Uh, you can't really free ride, as my father-in-law might have found out at one point, and I definitely found out at one point. You have to work together. You have to push in sync. You have to turn in sync. You have to be leaning the right way. Like, you all have to work together. That's why it's called a tandem bike, not a tension bike, because you have to work in tandem, not in tension. And when you work in tandem, despite the fact that your wife might have wrongly um, given you a penalty and made you sit back so you didn't win so that the bride could win. It's a ridiculous idea. Um, you would have won the race. Not salty about it. We would have, we would have run. Definitely would have won. Like solid 45 minutes ahead of everybody. Anyways, because we worked in tandem, there was a force that moved us. We weren't working in tension. When we worked in tension, we didn't go anywhere. And I think what Nahum is getting at is that God's justice and God's love are not two opposing forces and tension that somehow you have to reconcile, but they're two forces that work in tandem flowing out of the goodness of God, that they work together with one another, not against one another. See, we read it, but verse 7 stated that the Lord is good, and because God is good, God must be just. He wouldn't be just if he wasn't good. If he was unjust, he wouldn't be good. He would be bad. And because God is good, God must be loving. Verse 3 stated that God is great in power. And in verses 4 and 5, God makes uh, the sea turn into dry ground. He makes river dry land. He makes trees wither. He makes mountains shiver. He makes hills turn into flatlands. Because God is powerful, he can be just, and he can do what's right. Because God is Powerful God can be loving even when it seems like an impossible situation. God is good and God is powerful. Therefore, God is just and is loving and God can be just and can be loving. He has the goodness and the power for both of those things to be true at the same time. 
working together, not against. So how was God good? God's good by being loving and by being just. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God acts in justice and God acts in love. Now, what does that mean for us? It means that we can find comfort in chaos. It means when we find, have burdens, we can find peace. We can find rest. Because if I know that God is good and I trust that he's good, then I can know and trust that, that God's going to be just and he's going to be loving. And so I can rest, that I can find comfort and peace even in chaos. Nahum 1.6 says, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his wrath? Heat of his anger, sorry. Which is another one of these movie quotes. It's actually a direct quote from the uh, end of the book of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, we read, starting in verse chapter 2, You've wearied, or you've made tired, uh, Yahweh with your words. Uh, but you say, how have we wearied him by saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of Yahweh and he delights in them or by asking, where is the God of justice? And I think we've been there like when life just continues to be hard and the people who are not doing good in any sense of the word just seem to keep moving up and up and up and life just continues to seem easier and easier and better and better for them and you're just trying to do the right thing and life just keeps getting harder and harder and harder of you and there's this question that comes up of like what god like is 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 good evil now and evil good like i thought i was supposed to do the good thing but the people who do the evil thing the people who aren't living with any set of morals at work, at school, they just seem to get the advancements. They're the ones that seem to get the raises. They're the ones that seem to get the bids. They're the ones that seem to just keep moving forward. And when I try to do the right thing, it doesn't seem to work. Verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? What's the point of the opening of Nahum? The point's to, to comfort us with God's justice and God's love when life gets chaotic. How? by reminding us that the God who is just and the God who is loving is coming to be with us. Like the quote from Malachi gets dropped in the beginning of some of the Gospels where John the Baptist shows up and heralds the, the way of Jesus. And Nahum links to the same place. That where do we find comfort in chaos? It's not in trying to control what you can control. It's not in a bottle. It's not in a new relationship. It's not in a substance, whether it be chocolate or something a little harder. We find comfort in chaos in the Christ that God was sending. Like we, we, we really find the comfort in the chaos that we're seeking when we, we look to the one that God sent, like when we find Jesus. And I, and I know this is church, and that's the church answer, but he's the one that like really is control, not only over our life, but over the storm. Like he's really the one that can give us the peace that we're looking for. He's really the one that is the joy that like we're trying to get an endorphin hit to find. Like he really is the thing that we're seeking, just sometimes, oftentimes in like all the wrong places. Because Jesus is the one who's not only coming to comfort us but take our burdens from us. Like, remember, like, come to me, all who are weary and who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Like, come to me, like, you who life is just totally crazy and out of control, and you don't know how to turn, and, like, you're seeing the storm, and you don't know how to stop it. Like, come to me. Like, I'll take your problems. Like, he wants your problems. <laughs> He's not just like, you again? All right, I got an hour. Let me hear it. 
Yeah, you talked about that last week. You talked about that last week too. You you haven't fixed this yet? No. Like you again? Okay, let, like let's talk about it. Like I can take your problem. Like I've got shoulders and a back that's big enough for every single problem that you can bring me. Like life's out of control. I know. Like I can carry not only the out of controlness, I can carry you through the out of controlness and control the situation and bring you through the other side. Like you need someone to bear a burden, you need someone to bear a problem, you need someone to just be sane and insanity. He says, come to me. Like, I want your problems. I want your issues. Like, I want to give you comfort, and I want to take your chaos. Like, that's what Jesus does for us. Like, that's why God sent him. That's why he came to bring us comfort in our chaos, not just in an eternal sense, yes, but like in this life today and tomorrow. Because God in his goodness showed his love and his justice clearly. Yes, in Jesus' life, but ultimately in Jesus' death. Like We're here because we believe that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, and he died a death that we deserved. And it was in the cross that the justice and the love of God met. That he had to be just because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Like we've all, um, we've all uh, been a part of the entropy of the universe. Like we've all sinned and caused some chaos in the world. And because we've all sinned, like there was a just payment, the, 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 the right payment, the wages for sin is death. And God had to be just. And so someone had to pay for it. And God was just and became the justifier by punishing Jesus instead of us. And it was because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. That in the cross of Jesus, the justice of God is fully met. That the goodness and the requirements of God's goodness are found and paid for. And the love of God is made manifest according to 1 John. That it is clearly shown for the world to see that I love you and I'm going to pay for you. Why? Because I'm a good God who is just and can't turn a blind eye, but who's loving, so he's going to pay for it himself. And so it's in the cross that we can know two things. One, we're eternally and fully loved by God. Like God sent Jesus for you before you were here. Like, he loved you before you were. He loved you before you screwed up. He loved you before you did anything good. He loved you before you did anything right. And he's going to love you through every single one of those things that he's going to eternally and fully love you. And the cross of Jesus proves that because you weren't even around (laughs) and he loved you. And two, God will punish evil. In him, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like God didn't sweep our sin under the rug. He put his kid on a tree. Like he was just. And God didn't sweep sins of the world, sins against us, sins of nations, sins of powerful people, sins of powerless people under the rug. They either get counted on the cross of Christ or they come in the storm. Like, he will punish evil. And I know sometimes when evil just seems like it's winning, like he's not going to. Like, they're always going to get away with it. Like, they're just always going to win. Like, maybe I should just, like, give in a little bit because it seems to work out for everybody. And there never seems to be a consequence. No matter the cheats, no matter the lies, no matter the shady deals. No matter how evil the world gets, sometimes it just looks like there's not a consequence. And while, yes, the cross of Jesus screams to the universe that God loves his creation, the cross also shouts that sin has a payment. And it will either fall on Jesus or it will fall on us. Someone's going to pay. God will punish evil. 
Why? Because he's good. And because he's good, he wants us to find comfort even in our chaos. So what I want to leave you with this morning is just two questions. Where do you need comfort? Like where is the chaos and the entropy of the universe just beginning to press in? And maybe it's your own creating. Maybe it's not. But what what burden did you walk in here with, strapped to your back? Where do you need comfort? And second, who can you help comfort? Because it's not just you and it's not just me. Like there's chaos all across this room. There's burdens that we all walked in here with. There's burdens in your family. There's burdens in your workplaces. Like there's people in your life who, like life is a whole nother level of crazy than it is for you. And that doesn't mean that you don't have burdens, you don't have chaos, but like part of you goes like, thank you, Jesus. But how can you be a part of comforting them? Because God put you in their life to be full of grace and mercy that they might see Jesus in you and through you. So what burden did you walk in here with? Where do you need comfort? And who has God put in your life that you can help comfort? Because he's good. He can give us comfort even in our chaos. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you um, that you are good, uh, that you did see our greatest need, that you did come to take our burdens, that you did come to calm the storms. And so this morning in our souls, would we just say, Jesus, I need you to take this. That Jesus, I walked in here carrying this and I'm tired of it. That maybe Jesus, I I don't see how good is going to win out. That just the evil just seems to be too surmounting. So give me faith to believe. And would we lay burdens at your feet? And would we get to this morning just receive the grace of peace? Receive the grace of calm? Because you're the good shepherd. And so would you help us rest? Would you help us to lie down, to let the burden fall, and to find the rest that we need? I ask this in Jesus' name.